They're here, everyone. They are the smart kids at the shops with their mothers or fathers, riding their bikes around the streets and playing down by the river, as well as talking to their friends on their smartphones. Join the smart kids each week as they discover, explore, and solve the mysteries of today. Here's your host, J.T. Crowley. Good morning. It's a lovely sunny morning here in Derby in the United Kingdom. It's a blue sky. I'm sitting in the study here, looking over my front garden, and I can see the blue sky and the lovely colours of late spring in the garden. It's wonderful. This week in the podcast, kids, anyone who's listening, I'm going to read the last chapter, or an, an excerpt of the last chapter of The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham. And this chapter is called The Return of Ulysses. It's a book, kids, that you really should go and get and read the stories of you know, Toad, Mr. Badger, Mole, Ratty, and all the other characters that are in it. It's fabulous. And I know I've said it before, and I'm going to say it again. I love this book. But I'm going to read a little snippet of the last chapter. So, sit back, relax, and... Here I go. When it began to grow dark, the rat, with an air of excitement and mystery, summoned them back into the parlour, stood each of them up alongside his little heap, and proceeded to dress them up for the coming expedition. He was very earnest and thoroughgoing about it, and the affair took quite a long time. First, there was a belt to go round each animal, and then a sword to be stuck into each belt, and then a cutlass on the other side to balance it, then a pair of pistols, a policeman's truncheon, several sets of handcuffs, some bandages and sticking plaster, and a flask and a sandwich case. The badger laughed good humouredly and said, All right, ratty, <laughs> it amuses you and it doesn't hurt me. I'm going to do all I've got to do with this here stick. But the rat only said, Please, Badger, you know I shouldn't like you to blame me afterwards and say I have forgotten anything. When all was quite ready, the Badger took her dark lantern in one paw, grasped his great stick with the other and said, Now then, follow me. Mole first, because I'm very pleased with him. Rat next. Toad last. And look here, Toady, don't you chatter so much as usual, or you'll be sent back as sure as fate. The toad was so anxious not to be left out that he took up the inferior position assigned to him without a murmur, and the animals set off. The badger led them along by the river for a little way, and then suddenly swung himself over the edge into a hole in the river bank, a little above the water. The bold and the rat followed silently, swinging themselves successfully into the hole, as they had seen the badger do. But when it came to Toad's turn, of course, he managed to slip and fall into the water with a loud splash and a squeal of alarm. He was hauled out by his friends, rubbed down and wrung out hastily, comforted and set on his legs. But the badger was seriously angry and told him that the very next time he made a fool of himself, he would most certainly be left behind. So at last, they were in the secret passage, and the cutting out expedition had really begun. Oh, wow, this is really exciting, isn't it, kids? It was cold and dark and damp and low and narrow, and poor Toad began to shiver. <laughs> partly from the dread of what might be before him, part because he was wet through. The lantern was far ahead, and he could not help lagging behind a little in the darkness. Then he heard the rat call out warmly, Come on, Toad! And a terror seized him of being left behind, alone in the darkness, and he came on, and with such a rush that he upset the rat into the mole, and the mole into the badger, and for a moment all was confused. 
The badger thought they were being attacked from behind, and as there was no room to use a stick or a cutlass, drew a pistol and was on the point of putting a bullet into Toad. When he found out what had really happened, he was very angry indeed and said, Now, this is the last time that tiresome Toad shall be left behind. But Toad whimpered, and the other two promised that they would be answerable for his good conduct, and at last the badger was pacified, and the procession moved on. Only this time the rat brought up the rear with a firm grip on the shoulder of Toad. So they groped and shuffled along with their ears pricked up and their paws on their pistols, till at last the badger said, We ought by now to be pretty near under the hall. Then suddenly they heard, far away as it might be, and yet apparently nearly over their heads, a confused murmur of sound, as if people were shouting and cheering and stamping on the floor and hammering on tables. The toad's nervous terrors all returned, but the badger only remarked placidly, They're going at it. The weasels. The passage now began to slope upwards. They groped onward a little further, and then the noise broke out again, quite distinct this time, and very close above them. Hooray, 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 they heard, and the stamping of little feet on the floor, and the clinking of glasses as little fists pounded on the table. What a time they're having, said the badger. Come on! They hurried along the passage till it came to a full stop, and they found themselves standing under the trapdoor that led up into the butler's pantry. Such a tremendous noise was going on in the banqueting hall that there was little danger of them being overheard. The badger said, Now, boys, all together, and the four of them put their shoulders to the trapdoor and heaved it back. Hoisting each other up, they found themselves standing in the pantry with only a door between them and the banqueting hall where their unconscious enemies were carousing. The noise as they emerged from the passage was simply deafening. At last, as the cheering and the hammering slowly subsided, a voice could be made out saying, Well, I do not propose to detain you much longer. Great applause. Whee! But before I resume my seat, renewed the cheering. Whoa! I should like to say one word about our kind host, Mr. Toad. We all know Toad. We Good Toad, modest Toad, honest Toad, shrieks all the merriment. We Only, just let me get at him, muttered Toad, grinding his teeth. Hold on a minute, said the badger, restraining him difficultly. Get ready, all of you, get ready. Let me sing you a little song, went on the voice, which I have composed on the subject of Toad. A long silence. Then the chief weasel, for it was he, began in a high, squeaky voice. Today he went to pleasuring gaily down the street. The badger drew himself up. He took a firm grip of his stick with a bow of bows glanced round his comrades and cried, The hour has come, follow me, and flung the door open wide. My! What a squealing and a squeaking and a screeching filled the air. Well, might the terrified weasels dive under the tables and spring madly up at the windows. Well, might the ferrets rush wildly for the fireplace and get hopelessly jammed in the chimney. Well, might tables and chairs be upset and glass and china be sent crashing on the floor in the panic of that terror moment when the four heroes strode wrathfully into the room. The mighty badger, his whiskers bristling, his great cudgel whistling through the air. Mole, black and grim, brandishing his stick and shouting his awful war cry, A mole, a mole! Rats, desperate and determined, his belt bulging with the weapons of every age and every variety. Toad, frenzied with excitement and injured pride, swollen to pride, twice his original size, leaping into the air and emitting toad whoops that chilled them to the marrow. Toad, he went in the pleasuring. He yelled, I'll pleasure them, and he went straight for the chief weasel. They were but four in all, but to the panic-stricken weasels the hall seemed full of monstrous animals. Grey, black, brown and yellow, whooping and flourishing enormous cudgels, and they broke and fled with squeals of terror and dismay. 
this way and that, through the windows, up the chimney, anywhere to get out of the reach of these terrible sticks. The affair was soon over. Up and down the whole length of the hall strode the four friends, whacking their sticks at every head that showed itself, and in five minutes the room was cleared. Through the broken windows, the shrieks of terrified weasels escaping across the lawn were borne faintly to their ears. On the floor lay prostrate some dozen or so of the enemy, on whom the mole was busily engaging in fitting handcuffs. The badger, resting from his labours, leant on his stick and wiped his honest brow. Mole, he said. You are the best of fellows. Just cut along outside and look after those stoked sentries of yours and see what they're doing. I've an idea that, thanks to you, we shan't have much trouble from them tonight. The mole vanished promptly through a window and the badger bade the other two set a table, its legs again, pick up the knives and forks and plates and glasses from the debris on the floor and see if they could find materials for a supper. I want some grub, I do, I really do, he said in that rather common way he had of speaking. Stir your stumps, toad, and look alive. Where got your house back for you, and you don't offer us so much as a sandwich? Toad felt rather hurt that the badger didn't say pleasant things to him, as he said to the mole, and tell him what a fine fellow he was, and how splendidly he had fought, for he was rather particularly pleased with himself, and the way he had gone for the chief weasel and sent him flying and across the table one blow of his stick. But he bustled about, and so did the bat rats, and soon they found some guave jelly in a glass dish, and a cold chicken, a tongue that had hardly been touched, some trifle, and quite a lot of lobster salad, and in the pantry they came upon a basket of French rolls and a quantity of cheese, butter, and celery. They were just about to sit down when the mole clambered in through the window, chuckling with an armful of rifles. It's all over, he reported, from what I can make out, and as soon as the stoats, who were very nervous and jumpy already, heard the shrieks and the yells and the uproars from the inside the hall, some of them threw down their rifles and fled. The others stood fast for a bit, but then the weasels came rushing out upon them. They thought they were being betrayed, and the stoats grappled with the weasels, and the weasels fought to get away, and they wrestled and wriggled and punched each other and rolled over and over, till most of them rolled into the river. They've all disappeared by now, one way or another, and I've got their rifles, so that's all right. Excellent and deserving animal, said the badger, his mouth full of chicken and trifle. Now, there's just one more thing I want you to do, more before you sit down to your supper, along of us, and I wouldn't trouble you, only I know I can trust you to see a thing done. And I wish I could say, the same of everyone I know. I'd send Rat, if he wasn't a poet. I want you to take those fellows on the floor there, upstairs with you, and have some bedrooms cleaned out and tidied up and made really comfortable. See that they sweep under the beds and put clean sheets of pillowcases on and turn down one corner of the bed clothes, just as you know it ought to be done, and have a can of hot water and clean towels and fresh cakes of soap put in each room. And then you can give them a licking apiece, if it's any satisfaction to you, and put them out the back door, and we shan't see any more of them. I fancy, and then come along and have some of this cold tongue. It's first rate. I'm very pleased with you, Mole. The good-natured Mole picked up a stick, formed his presence up in a line on the floor, gave them the order, Quick march! And led his squad off to the upper floor. After a time he appeared again, smiling, and said that every room was ready, and as clean as a new pin. And I didn't have to click them, he added. I thought, only the whole, they had had clicking enough for one night, and the weasels, when I put the point to them, quite agreed with me. And they said they wouldn't think of troubling me. They were very per penitent, and said they were extremely sorry for what they had done. But it was all the fault of the chief weasel and the stoats. And if ever they could do anything for us at any time to make up, we have only got to mention it. So I gave them a roll apiece, and let them out at the back, and off they ran as hard as they could. Then the mole pulled his chair up to the table, 
shuffled up to the table, sat down and pitched into the cold tongue, and toad like the gentleman he was, put all his jealousy from him, and said heartily, Thank you kindly, dear Mole, for all your pains and trouble tonight, and especially for your cleverness this morning. The badger was pleased at that, and said, There spoke my brave toad. So they finished their supper in great joy and contentment, and presently retired to rest between clean sheets, save in toads and sassinal home. Won back by matchless valour, consummate strategy, and a proper handling of sticks. The following morning, Toad, who had overslept himself as usual, came down to breakfast, disgracefully late, and found on the table a certain quantity of eggshells, some fragments of cold and leathery toast, a coffee pot, three fours empty, and really little else, which did not tend to improve his temper, considering that, after all, it was his own house. Through the French windows of the breakfast room, he could see the mole and the water rat sitting in wicker chairs out on the lawn, evidently telling each other stories, roaring with laughter and kicking their short legs in the air. The badger, who was in an armchair and deep in the morning paper, merely looked up and nodded when Toad entered the room. But Toad knew this man, so he sat down and made the best breakfast he could, merely observing to himself that he would get square with the others sooner or later. When he had nearly finished, the badger looked up and remarked rather shortly, I'm sorry, Toad, but I'm afraid there's a heavy morning's work in front of you. You see, we really ought to have a banquet at once to celebrate this affair. It is expected of you. In fact, it's the rule. Oh, all right, said the Toad readily, uh, read, uh, readily um, anything to oblige. Though why on earth you should want to have a banquet in the morning, I cannot understand. But, you know, I do not lie to please myself, but merely to find out what my friends want, and then try and arrange it for them. You dear old Badger. Don't pretend to be stupider than you really are, replied Badger crossly. And don't chuckle and splutter in your coffee while you're talking. It's not manners. What I mean is, the banquet will be at night. Of course, but the invitations will have to be written and got off at once, and you've got to write them. Now, sit down at the table. There's a stack of letter paper on it, with Toad Hall at the top in blue and gold, and write invitations to all our friends, and if you stick to it, we shall get them out before luncheon. And I'll bear a hand too and take my share of the burden. I'll order the banquet. What? cried Toad in dismay. Me? Stop indoors and write a lot of rotten letters on a jolly morning like this when I want to go round my property and set everything and everybody to rights and swagger about and enjoy myself? Certainly not. I'll be... I'll see you stop a minute, though. Why, of course, dear Badger. What is my pleasure or convenience compared to with that of others? You wish it done, and it shall be done. Go, Badger, order the banquet. Order what you like. Then join your young friends outside in their innocent mirth, oblivious of me and my cares and toils. I have sacrificed this fair morning on the altar of duty and friendship. The badger looked at him very suspiciously. But Toad's frank, open countenance made it difficult to suggest any unworthy motive in his change of attitude. He quitted the room accordingly in the direction of the kitchen, and as soon as the door had closed behind him, Toad hurried to the writing table. A fine idea occurred to him while he was talking. He would write the invitations, and he would take care to mention the leading part he had taken in the fight, and how he had laid the chief weasel flat. And he would hint at his adventures, and what a career of triumph he had to tell about. And on the fly-leaf, he would set out a sort of a programme of entertainment for the evening. Something like this, as he sketched it out in his head. So, he would have a speech, speech by Toad, the evening, addresses, Toad, the waterway, how to deal property, back to the land, song, himself, other compositions, Toad, and the ending, Toad's composition. 
the idea pleased him mightily, and he worked very hard and got all the letters finished by noon, at which hour it was reported to him that there was a small and rather bedraggled weasel at the door, inquiring timidly whether he could be of any service to the gentleman. Tote swaggered out and found it was one of the prisoners of the previous evening, very respectful and anxious to please. He patted him on the head, shoved the bundle of invitations into his paw, and told him to cut along quickly and deliver them as fast as he could, and if he would like to come back again in the evening, perhaps there might be a shilling for him. Or again, perhaps there might. And the poor weasel seemed really quite grateful, and hurried off eagerly to do his mission. When the other animals came back to luncheon, very boisterous and breezy after morning on the river, the mole, whose conscience had been prickling him, looked doubtfully at Toad, expecting to find him sulky or depressed. Instead, he was so uppish and inflated that the mole began to suspect something, while the rat and the badger exchanged significant glances. As soon as the meal was over, Toad thrust his paws deep into his trouser pockets remarked casually, Well, look after yourselves, you fellows, ask for anything you want, and was swaggering off in the direction of the garden, where he wanted to think out an idea or two for his coming speeches, when the rat caught him by the arm. Toad rather suspected what he was after, and did his best to get away, but when the badger took him firmly by the other arm, he began to see that the game was up. The two animals conducted him between them into the small smoking room that opened out of the entrance hall, shut the door and put him into a chair. And they both stood in front of him while Toad sat silent and regarded them with such suspicion and ill humour. Now look here, Toad, said the rat. It's about this banquet. I'm very sorry I am to have to speak to you about this, but we want you to understand clearly, once and for all, that there are going to be no speeches and no songs. Try and grasp the fact that on this occasion... We're not arguing with you, we're just telling you. Toad saw that he was trapped. They understood him. They saw through him. They had got ahead of him. His pleasant dream was shattered. Mayn't I sing just one little song? He pleaded piteously. No, not one little song, replied the rat firmly. Though his heart bled as he noticed the trembling lip of the poor disappointed toad. It's no good, Toady. You know well that your songs are all conceit and boasting and vanity, and your speeches are all self-praise, and, 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 well, you grossly exaggerate. And? And? And gas, put in the badger in his common way. There you go, kids. That is the last of the little um, snippets I'm going to read to you from The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham. A great book. Um... So, what am I going to do next week? Hmm, I might do a couple of things. I might read um, from another book. It might be Tom Sawyer, I don't know. Um, but I've certainly got some authors lined up for you guys to listen to, how they write their books, how they create their plots, their stories, and what um, made them write and what brought them to writing. So for now, as I say, most weeks, stay safe, have fun, kids. Enjoy the reading the books, and certainly I hope you enjoy reading my Smart Kids books, which you can get on Amazon, or my 17 characters, which I originally started the podcast off with. So from a lovely sunny morning here in Derby in the United Kingdom, at half an hour, thank you for listening. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Smart Kids. <laughs> Want to follow more of their adventures? Check out the Smart Kids by J.T. Crowley on Amazon.com now.